name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and they called his name Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. On Wednesday night, during our Advent study, we posed the question, or the the question was posed, what was one of your favorite Christmas memories? And that got me to thinking I had a Christmas memory that should have probably been one of the greatest Christmas memories, but turned out not to be such a great Christmas memory. Liz and I had been married for about six months. We were going to celebrate our first Christmas together, which in and of itself, we were in Florida. Our parents were in Pennsylvania. I think her parents were still in Pennsylvania at the time. So we were going to have Christmas all together, but I had been working in a psychiatric hospital and being only there for about five months after graduating from college, I drew the lucky straw that I had to work with the nurse on Christmas morning. So I had to be at work at seven o'clock in the morning to work till probably about, I think, nine o'clock that night because they just split it up into two shifts for Christmas. And we had released as many of the patients as we could. There was only two or three patients still in the facility, and it was a very quiet, calm morning, nothing much going on until about 11 o'clock, when the police brought in a woman who was very well-dressed, very well-groomed, a beautiful young woman, followed closely by her husband and two beautiful children, probably ages five and three, who also were very well-dressed and very well-groomed in a very nice car, and they brought her into the facility. She was medically cleared, and then it was my turn to see what was going on. And I found out that she had attempted suicide on Christmas morning because she didn't get what she wanted. (laughs) And that initially was my reaction, like, you've got to be kidding me. And what she wanted was a fur coat (laughs) in Florida. Not that she didn't get any nice gifts for Christmas, not that she didn't have a wonderful Christmas morning, she didn't get what she wanted. And I was a little angry and perturbed at it because, you know, it was Christmas morning and it had been quiet. It was just the nurse and me and a couple patients and things were just quiet and calm and we didn't have to worry a whole lot about doing much. And now I got to spend the day speaking with this woman and I come to find out that all of her life, she had been told that she was not good enough. She was discouraged in everything that she had ever done, from her education in in high school and middle school to the sports that she played. She was constantly being put down and told that what she was doing was not good enough, to her career in college, to her job. She always seemed that she was never good enough. So to fill that void, she believed that she would find happiness in things. She was completely and totally unable to attach herself to the joy that she had in having a loving husband and children, a wonderful home, and a husband of means. They, they had enough financial means that they could get out of this Baker Act facility and go to a different treatment facility. Unfortunately, it was Christmas, and we weren't going to get a hold of a psychiatrist that day to come in and move her to another facility. So she was there for the day and the night. She had a lot of things to be blessed by and to be joyful in, but she could not attach herself to the joy of Christmas because she was searching for happiness in things. And she was doing that, as I said, because she felt that all her life she had been told she was not good enough. And isn't that the culture that we live in? If you think about the advertisements that we see on television, they're all geared at telling us we're not good enough. We're not thin enough. We need to go on this diet. We're not successful enough, so we need to drive a certain kind of car. We don't smell good enough, so you need to buy this perfume. The underlying message in a lot of our advertising is that we're not good enough. But as children of Christ, of children of God, we have been attached to the joy of Christmas in Jesus Christ, and instead of being discouragers in this world, we should be joyful encouragers. 
You've probably heard the story of the little boy who was in his church's Christmas pageant. And he was to play the part of the angel that said, Behold, I bring great glad tidings of good news. All through the rehearsal, he could not get that line out. That was his only line, as he was to walk up and say that line. He practiced it and practiced it. His parents tried to help him. The, the children's directors and the Sunday school teachers tried to help him learn how to say that line. Behold, I bring glad tidings of great joy. See, when I said it the first time, I had a hard time saying it. It's not a natural thing to say. So he practiced and practiced, and he never got it. The night of the Christmas pageant came, the church was filled, the walls were pushing out, there were so many people in the church, grandparents and parents and friends and relatives of all these young people who were going to do the pageant. And it came to that moment when he was to deliver his line and everybody collectively held their, vo held their breath because they knew not what was going to come out of his mouth. And what he said is, boy, have I got good news for you. Isn't that the message of Christmas? Boy, have I got good news for you. And not just the good news that God is with us, Emmanuel, God with us, that God is with us and God will see us through, but we have a message of good news to people. We wonder oftentimes when we go to evangelize and tell people of Jesus Christ and of our faith, how do we do that? Tell them, boy, have I got good news for you. God is with us and God will be with us and is going to see us through. And maybe we should use the gift of joy, of encouragement in the coming year to be encouraging to people. The joy of Christmas continues. The gift of joy continues when we say to somebody, you did that very well. That was awesome. You got to see I'm so proud of you. You did good on that task at work. You're awesome. I love you. You're wonderful. You're fantastic. Oftentimes we say, you got to see you could do so much better. I was at a church not long ago, and the, the technology guy came alongside the pastors, there was a bunch of other people gathered around, and he said, you know, we need to get together to talk about Sunday service and how well the, you know, the technology and the stuff went on Sunday. And he, the pastor's reply to his technology guy was, it was good enough for you. That's not really encouraging, is it? And really, the underlying message there is really rather discouraging. It was good enough for you. Does that mean it wasn't good enough for him or anyone else? It was good enough for you. And we give that message to a lot of people a lot of times. That's good enough for you. We should be the children of God who are joyful encouragers. Telling people, we can do it. You can do it. God has great things planned for you and for us. We can do it. We should be excited about that and live into that joy. We should be joyful encouragers. We should also understand the joy of thoughtfulness that comes with Christmas. The joy of... At Christmas time, more so than any other time of the year, we do what? We, we send more cards and more letters. We make more phone calls. We send more emails. We make more cookies and food, and, and we talk to our neighbors more. We're friendlier to people in the grocery stores and in, at the Walmarts and, and the shopping centers that we go to at Christmas than any other time of the year. We are thoughtful of other people. And that joy should penetrate the root of the word thoughtfulness to what is the root of thoughtfulness? Thought. And the joy that we should experience should be the joy that we experience in our thoughts. In her book, Beautiful Darkness, I don't know if you've ever heard of this book, I, Cami Garcia writes, when you look up, do you see the blue sky of what might be or the darkness of what will never be? Do you see me? 
What do you see when you look up? Do you see the blue skies of the possibilities of what God is doing in your life, no matter what your station or situation, no matter what your age, no matter where you are or what you're doing? Do you see the blue skies of the possibilities in your thoughts, or do you see the darkness and despair of where you are? If we are children of God, born anew of Jesus Christ, we should be seeing the blue skies of the possibilities of the things that can be. How God is working in and through us in our lives. When you look up, do you see the blue sky of what might be or the darkness of what will never be? Do you see me? One of the tough things about being a pastor is that you hear everybody's sad, sad story. And you can imagine the number of sad stories, not only just in this congregation, but the number of times the phone rings every day at this church and I hear a sad story or Deanne gets the pleasure of hearing the sad story because she has the compassion in her heart to say he doesn't need another one. Yet we don't see the blessings of the blue skies in the darkness, do we? We don't see that we have a roof over our head, a car to drive, food in our stomach. We have children and family and friends around us. We don't see the blessings of a church family or our own families. We don't see how God has put people in our paths that we might be a witness to, to help uplift them. We don't see the possibilities of the greatness of things that we might be able to do. Because our thoughts and our thinking is on this horrible darkness of the sky of things that can never be. When God is working in and through everything because Emmanuel, God, is with us. And God will see us through. What do you see when you look up? Do you see the blue sky? Or do you see the darkness? Many of us today saw the darkness as they came into church five minutes before it was supposed to start. But you know, ten minutes before this service started, the sky was blue. God might be telling you something. Come a little bit earlier, you won't get wet. And as children of God and in the the birth of the baby, we see the joy of graciousness. We see God's grace pouring out into this life of this little baby. We see the gift of how to be gracious, how to be giving and sacrificial in what we do. Glenn Kittler tells of a story of Father Bonaventure, who was a Catholic priest in a parish in near Tucson, Arizona, one Christmas, he decided, or his church decided to throw a Christmas party, kind of very similar to what we did last week, this birthday party for Jesus, for the Papago, see, I looked at it, and then the Papago, see, I'm thinking Melanie Papagallo, Papago, who knows, you may be Native American, (laughs) all right, Ever been to Arizona? The Papago tribe in Ari- near Tucson, Arizona, they threw a birthday party, a party of sorts for Jesus. Kids came from the tribe. Kids from the church came. They played together. They did crafts together. They fellowshiped together. They ran around and had fun together. As the day ended, they lined all the children up, and, and Father Bonaventure handed out to each child as they left the church a bag that was filled with candy. When they got to a little boy named Louis Pablo, Louis looked up at Father Bonaventure and said, could I have three more? And the father looked down at him and said, "Um, I'm sorry, there's only one bag of candy per kid. He said, oh no, Father, I'm not asking for three more bags of candy. Could I just have three more bags? And puzzled Father Bonaventure got him three empty bags and handed him the three empty bags along with his bag of candy. And then the children left the church. And Father Bonaventure went about cleaning up and finishing up the day. But as he looked out the window, he saw Louis 
sitting underneath a tree with his candy spread out in front of him and all four bags opened up and putting a piece of candy in each bag and doing it again. You see, Lewis had three little brothers and sisters at home who were too young to come to the party. So in his graciousness, he was seeing to it that out of what God had blessed him with, he was able to be a blessing to someone else. That is the joy of graciousness at Christmas, that gift that can keep on giving. God has blessed us immensely. Immensely God has blessed us. And through what we have to share with others in a sacrificial and gracious way, the lives that we can touch and change. The gifts that keep on giving we've looked at already as the gift of hope and the gift of love. Today we should be experiencing the gift of joy. And three ways that that gift can continue to give of itself today and tomorrow and in every day to come so that it is always Christmas is that we share the gift of joy in our graciousness that we share the gift of joy that comes from our thoughts, and that we share the gift of joy in the way that we encourage others around us in this world. God is with us, Emmanuel. As I read through the scripture again this morning in, in my preparation, this had, the power of this one line had escaped me for a long time. But the one line that says, after they tell him what his name should be, Emmanuel, God with us, Scripture tells us, Joseph woke from his sleep. When are we going to wake from our sleep and begin sharing and spreading the joy of Christ in the way that we encourage others, in the ways that we think about our lives and our situations, and about the ways that we are gracious to other people. When do we awake from our sleep? When he woke from his sleep, the next line is just as powerful. He went and did as the angel of the Lord told him. Sometimes I think that's why we sleep because we really don't want to go do what the angel of the Lord has told us. It takes effort to encourage people. It's not hard to discourage them. We see it everywhere. I have vivid images and memories of coaches my whole life, and you watch it on professional sports and college sports, of coaches grabbing people by the face and yelling at them, telling them what they're doing is not good enough. There are a few good coaches who you see encouraging players as they come off the field or out of the swimming pool or off the basketball courts or off the gymnastic apparatus. But for the most part, they're always in their face telling them that wasn't good enough. That's the message that we receive all the time. We are not good enough. In God's eyes, we are better than good enough. We are God's children, and God loves us just the way we are. And he has set us up to be joyful in the way that we encourage ourselves and the world around us. In a world that desperately needs to be encouraged, who is going to do it if we do not wake up and go and do as the angel of the Lord has told us? If we do not wake up and start having good thoughts and seeing the blue skies of what might be, the way that God is working in and through us, We're still asleep. And if we don't wake up and start being gracious and giving, being sacrificial in, in all that we do, we are still sleeping. It is time, with the advent of the birth of Christ, to wake up and go and do as the angel of the Lord has told you. In the next couple months in the life of this church, I think we are on the precipice of some incredibly wonderful things happening. 
that I cannot share with you at this very moment. But there's also a lot of excitement that can be gained in anticipation. Think of that anticipation the way little ones think of the anticipation of Christmas morning. I think of the anticipation of one that came up here this morning to tell us he was 18. I'm picking on you again. <laughs> and those of you who know him, how many of, him, of you he told he was 18 today <laughs> before he ever got up here? We've been being told that for the last month and a half. <laughs> on, my birthday is six weeks, three days, and four hours away. <laughs> Constantly being reminded the anticipation of turning 18. I don't know why he's so great at being 18. I guess he's legal now and can buy lottery tickets. Because <laughs> he better not start smoking. <laughs> Anticipate that God is working in and amongst us. That God is working in this church and on this property and in this community to bring something great to happen. We can do it. You can do it. Together we will all do it, blessed by God. For God's grace is pouring out on us at this very moment. <coughs> Great things are ahead of us. When we look up, do we see the blue skies? Or do we see darkness? Do we have joy in our hearts? Do we have joy in our minds? Do we have joy in our actions? Are we still living in the dark? For in God, John's gospel, he said, Behold, there was a light. I am the light of the world. We no longer need to live in the darkness of the despair. We need to live in the blue skies of the possibilities of what might be. What might God be doing in your life and in the life of this church that we can be excited and joyful about this Christmas? Continue to encourage one another. Continue to think blessed, joyful thoughts. And continue in the joy of being gracious. And what God has planned, we cannot stop. Live in the blue skies. Know that the darkness has been overcome by the light of God in Jesus Christ. And may God add a blessing to your understanding of this message. Amen.